sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You get a call that a bank has been robbed. From the M.O., you know the job was done by a professional. He's made good his escape. Your job? Get him. Here's what leading tobacco publications have had to say about regular and king-size Chesterfield. U.S. Tobacco Journal, Boston, Massachusetts. Chesterfield cigarettes in the new king size is still maintaining large turnovers in this area. Dealers report that sales continue to climb on this size, and it seems that volume on the regular size has climbed to new heights with its new big brother. And Tobacco Leaf reports from Chicago. More calls for Chesterfield king-size cigarettes than for most brands being marketed. The reason for king-size Chesterfield's amazing success is this. All king-size cigarettes give you quantity, but only Chesterfield king-size gives you quantity plus quality, premium quality. That means Chesterfield king-size contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. The same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. Enough more of this tobacco to give you more than a fifth longer smoke. So remember, Chesterfield is the only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Buy them either way you like them. Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder. <laughs> The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, January 21st. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. It was 2.56 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Joe? Yeah. Sure cold out. Yeah, the paper says you'd warm up a little before the end of the week. Well, I hope so. How'd your weekend go? Don't bring it up. What happened? At my house, there's only one thing that could happen. What do you mean? My brother-in-law, Armand. All the time, he just sits around the house, sits there and reads those detective magazines. Doesn't he work? If he's ever held a job, he's kept it a secret. Just moves around between the relatives. This year, it's Faye's turn. And he just sits around all day, huh? Yeah. Reads those detective magazines. Always send in for those books that are sent in the plain wrappers. You know, the ones that tell you how you can have a business in your own home. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, this time, he really did it. He sent for one that tells you how to go into the house cleaning business. Yeah. I thought at first it might be a pretty good deal. You know, if it worked out, he could give Faye a hand with the house. Uh -huh. Well, Saturday morning, the book gets to the house with all the formulas and instructions for making the cleaners for the rugs and the upholstery. Yeah. First off, he borrows five bucks from me to buy the stuff to mix the formulas. Then he goes to the kitchen and takes all of Faye's good pants to mix up the goop in. It smells terrible. Uh -huh. All those bleaches and soaps. And... I'm sitting in the front room watching television. All in all, I'm pretty comfortable. He comes in, he says the room is filthy, and he's going to clean it. Tells me to get out of the room, and that he's going to surprise all of us. Yeah. Well, he did. Faye and I took the kid down to the barber's to have her hair cut, did a little shopping for the weekend. He should have seen the house when we got back, Joe. Just miserable. And what had he done? First off, he wasn't there. Left a note on the kitchen table telling us that he was out for a walk. I kind of figured what had happened, so Faye and me walked into the living room. Joe, you wouldn't believe it. Is that so? Faye almost fainted. Pretty awful, huh? Worse than that. Room was beautiful. Everything in it was clean as a whistle. All spotless. Curtains, carpet, the upholstery. Even the tables had been waxed. Well, what's wrong with that? Sounds to me like a pretty good deal. Faye. But what about her? Right away, she starts climbing all over me, reading me off for being so mean to him. 
says all about how I should be ashamed of myself, said that I should have thought of the house cleaning gimmick myself. I should have given him a hand in cleaning up the place, and that the next day off, we have to do the whole house. I tell you, Joe, no matter what the guy does, it always ends up making me look bad. Well, you say you've only got this year with him, huh? Yeah. Then he goes to Faye's sister in Piedmont. I'll sure be glad when that time comes. Yeah, I don't blame you. Hot shot. I'll get it. ADT-211, bank robbery in progress. It took us a little over four minutes to get to the bank at the corner of Lebanon and Broadway. In that time, the bandit had completed the robbery and made good his escape. A radio car had arrived at the scene, and the officers had gotten a description of the car and of the bandit. They called the information into communications, and a broadcast was gotten out to all cars in the vicinity to be on the alert for the holdup man. 2.40 p.m., Frank and I arrived at the bank. Back there, the bank guard. Yeah. I couldn't, Mother. What do you want me to do? Try to stop and have him shoot that gun off? You'd have killed half the people in here. I'm not saying that you should have actually tried to stop him. All I'm saying is that there is something that you should have done. You just stood there and looked at him. You could see the gun. There must have been something you could do. I beg your pardon, sir. You get away. You're probably in cahoots with the robber. You probably came back to get the rest of the money. Well, Gibson, don't just stand there. Stop these men. We're police officers, sir. You see, Gibson, they're police officers. You have a badge or something? After this, I don't think I'll trust anyone again. Yes, sir. Here's our identification. Oh, yeah, it's Officer Friday. It's my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? Hi. I suppose you want to ask me a lot of questions. Well, there are some things we'd like to know, sir. You'd like to talk in my office, I guess. It'll be more quiet there. That'll be fine. Would it be all right if Gibson came along? I'd like to have him see how a couple of real detectives work. Yes, sir, I think it'll be all right. Fine. Back this way. Oh, Officer Friday, this is Gibson, the bank guard, and I use the term loosely. This is Mr. Jones. That's Smith, sir. Frank Smith. Hmm? Oh, yes, yeah, Smith. Sorry. Go ahead. Just sit down any place. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, you listen good, Gibson. Yes, sir. Mr. Allen, you were the victim, were you? I certainly was. It was just 3 o'clock. Gibson was just putting up the chain across the door, you know, to keep people out. Yes, sir. Gibson was out there. I was in here in my office. Go ahead, Gibson. Tell the officers about it. Yes, sir. Well, he parked his car right in front of the bank, and when he pulled up, I thought it was a customer trying to get in before the bank closed. I held the chain for him. That was nice of you. What happened then, Mr. Gibson? As soon as he got to the doorway, I saw the shotgun. He had it kind of under his coat. You know, I tried to stop him, but he had the gun pointed right at me. He said that if I made a move, he'd as soon shoot me as look at me. Mm-hmm. You sure it was a shotgun, eh? Yes, sir. I could tell it was a 12-gauge. It was sawed off. He told me to get over in that little alcove near the entrance to our escrow department. Mm-hmm. I did. Then he told me to hand over my gun. I started to get it out of the holster. I thought that maybe I'd have a chance to surprise him, but he must have known what I was planning. Why do you say that? He told me to face him in the corner. Then he took the gun out of the holster. Mm-hmm. Well, I did what he told me. Well, what happened then? He asked me where the manager was. I pointed out his office. Well, to this time, did any of the people in the bank have any idea what was going on? No, sir. The way he acted, he knew what he was doing. Right off, I knew there wasn't anything I could do. I kept thinking about the people in the bank. That shotgun didn't want anyone to get hurt. The only bright thing he did. Do right, you want to go on? What happened then? Well, like I said, he asked where the manager's office was. I showed him, and he told me he wanted me to go back there with him. Uh Uh-huh. We walked back there. He put the shotgun under his coat, and by some miracle, nobody saw it. That's where he brought me into the picture. He just walked in, told me it was a stick-up. He had this little leather bag, the kind a doctor uses. Uh He opened it up, told me to walk in front of him. Uh Uh-huh. He made me carry the bag. Uh Kept the gun at my back all the time. I could feel it. Made me walk down the row of windows, the ones into the teller's boxes. Each one, he made me stop and ask the tellers for the money. Did he touch anything at all, do you remember? No, no, he wore gloves all the time. He was real careful, wouldn't touch anything. After I put the money into the bag, he'd tell each one of them that if they made a sound, he'd kill me, then come back and kill them, too. It was terrible. Almost scared me to death. Well, who was it that turned in the alarm here? Walter, the cleanup man, sir. He was in the back of the bank, and he came out of the vice president's office. He saw the robber, and then he sneaked back into the room and called you. The bandit just barely got out of the place when the police car pulled up. We gave the other officers a description of the car and the bandit. Yes, sir. We heard the broadcast. All the cars in the area have been alerted. I wonder if I could have a drink of water, officer. I'm so nervous. I'm still not over it. My stomach's going to be grinding for a month. You're a member of the Federal Reserve here, aren't you? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, then the Federal Bureau of Investigation will be in on it, too. Yes, sir. Water's right over here. I keep it in the office for my pills. I have ulcers, you know. Yes, sir. Would you like a drink? No, sir. No, No. thank you. you. Well, what happened after the man finished taking the money from the cages? He walked out of the front of the place and got in his car. By that time, I could hear the sirens of the police car coming. He'd just left. On the way out, he said if we told him anything about him, he'd come back and kill us. Yes, and he looked right at me when he said it. 
You've got to give me some sort of protection. I'm not going to make a sitting duck of myself. We'll take care of that, sir. Could you give us a description of the man, sir? I've already given it to the two officers who are here. Well, we know, sir, but if you wouldn't mind. Of course not. How tall would you say he was? Oh, about 5'11", maybe 6 feet. How old would you say he was? 30, 35, round in there. Mm-hmm. How much do you think he weighed? Oh, about 160, maybe more. I'm not very good at guessing weights. How about his coloring? Would be dark or light? Light, light. He had real light blonde hair. His eyebrows were almost invisible. They were so light that you almost couldn't see them at all. Same with his eyelashes. Mm-hmm. How about his clothes? Beg your pardon? His clothes? What was he wearing? Well, he had on a blue shirt. No, I'm sorry, sir. I think it was a white shirt. Was it? No, I'm sure it was blue. Right. I remember because he was wearing a brown coat. I thought that he certainly didn't have very good taste. What with wearing a blue shirt and a brown coat? No, Gibson, no. The shirt was blue. No tie. Brown coat and black loafer shoes. I remember these because they were the only thing about him that looked good. They looked like those ones that are advertised in the magazines, you know, Skegums or something like that. Black. Mm-hmm. Was there anything unusual about him? I beg pardon? Anything unusual about him? Anything that might cause you to remember him? Know him if you saw him again? Well, there were the bandages. What's that, sir? When he came in, he had bandages on his face. One over his right eyebrow, another on his chin. Right here, sort of uh, on the throat. You mean regular bandages? No, sir. They were those adhesive kind, you know, with a gauze and tape all together. Oh, yeah. And you say he had one over the right eyebrow and one on his chin? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. I still think it's a white shirt. I said it was blue. Are you trying to say that I don't know blue when I see it? No, sir. I just think that you might have made a mistake in all the excitement. Officer. Yes, sir? It was a blue shirt. All right, sir. How about his car, the one he got away in? It was parked right out in front. Did you see it? Certainly I saw it. I was standing right in the door when he drove away. Well, can you describe the car for us? Yes, like I told the other officers, it was a late model Buick, dark blue, a coupe. I'm sorry, sir, but it was a green Ford. Well, right, now let's see if we can't let Mr. Allen tell his story, Mr. Gibson. We'll check it with you when we finish with him, all right? Mm-hmm. I don't know what you're trying to prove with these officers. After the way you handled the affair, there's no use trying to impress them with your prowess as a detective. It was a dark blue Buick coupe. Now, anything unusual about the car that you could see? Any dented fenders, stickers, windshield emblems, anything like that, would you remember? No, I didn't notice anything special. No, sir. It looked pretty new, as far as I could tell. All right, fine. Well, you two gentlemen have helped us a lot here. There are some questions we'd like to ask the other people in the bank. Oh, yes, that's what the other officers said. I told them all to stay. You'd like to talk to them now? Yes, sir. Fine, I'll send them in here to you. No, we can talk to them out there, sir. It'll be all right. Oh, fine. Gibson, maybe you can help them. Yeah. Officer. Yes, Gibson. I didn't want to tell you while we were in there. He'd probably make some remark. I didn't even tell the other officers. It's about the license number of the bandit's car. Did you get it? Well, not all of it, sir. Just the first three numbers. The bank guard went on to explain that in the confusion, he had failed to give the information about the license number to the other officers. We continued to talk to him. He told us that the bandit had tied a cloth over the rear license plate and that as he drove away from the scene, a corner of the cloth had come loose, and he was able to see the first three numbers of the plate. We called this information into communications, and a supplemental broadcast was gotten out. In company with agents from the FBI, we talked to the rest of the employees in the bank. From them, we got a fairly good description of the holdup man and of his car. They agreed that it was a late model dark Ford sedan. With FBI agent Tom Ashford, Frank and I checked by the office and asked the stats office to make a run on the M.O., We checked the oddity file on R&I on the possibility that the tape might have been used to cover scars or other marks that would make identification easier. 9.46 p.m. We stopped and got some sandwiches and coffee, and then we went to the DMV offices. Hi, Joe. George, you know Frank. Yeah, hi. How's it going, George? This is Tom Ashford, agent from the FBI. He's working with us on this thing. Oh, hi. Glad to know you. Yeah, same here. Where do we find the files here, George? Oh, what's the number again? Uh, 1U5. That's all we have. Not much. Oh, you'll find the files of that number in these drawers here. Uh, you know what kind of car it is? Yeah, Ford sedan, late model. We're not sure what year. Uh-huh. Oh, well, go to it. I don't envy you. Yeah, 9,999 possible. Mm-hmm. Well, that's it for the night. I think I'll shove off. Anything you guys need, there'll be somebody here. You can give me a call. I'll leave my home number on the desk. Right, thanks a lot. Good night, George. Right, good night. Good night. Hope you find it before I get back. Yeah. So do we. Well, let's get to it. Huh? Right. Let's see. 1U5. It took us the next eight hours to go through the almost 10,000 license registrations. Each file card had to be checked for a similarity of make and model. Each automobile in the Los Angeles area was listed, and then each one in the entire state. Each of them had to be checked out. 6.02 a.m., Tuesday, January 22nd. We finished checking the files. That does it. I didn't know there were so many cars in California. 
let alone that many with a license that begins with 1U5 in the Los Angeles area. What's the total, Joe? How's it look? Well, we've got a place to start here. 302 names. 6.30 a.m., we checked back into the office, and then we went home to get a couple of hours sleep. At 8.30 a.m., Frank, Tom, and I met in the robbery office. Captain Didion had assigned four other teams of men to work with us. The FBI had also assigned additional agents. The list of possibles was divided up, and we began to check them out. We spent three days on it. In each instance, we didn't talk to the person involved directly, but to their neighbors. We didn't explain what it was that we were after, merely that we were conducting an investigation. We ran into the usual false leads, the usual petty jealousies, and the neighborhood feuds. It all served to slow us down and make the job more difficult. There'd been no replies to the local or the APB that we'd gotten out on the car or the bandits. The staff's office had come up with two possibles on the M.O. These were both checked out but led us nowhere. We went back to checking out the license plate numbers. January 28th. The names on our list were down to seven. The next one was a Mr. Ivan Q. Field. We rang the bell to the house next door and waited. Yes? Sorry to bother you, ma'am. Police officers, wonder if we could talk to you. Police? Well, what's it about? I haven't done anything. No, ma'am. We'd just like to ask you a couple of questions about your next-door neighbor, Mr. Field. Well, I should have known. I thought a couple of times about calling you about him myself. Miserable man. I wonder if we could come in, ma'am. Might be better than talking on the porch. You just bet you can. Come right in. I'll tell you what you want to know. Thank you very much. What are you wanting for? What's he done? Well, we're just conducting an investigation, ma'am. A few things we'd like to know about Mr. Field. Uh-huh. Well, you don't have to play cozy with me. I know what kind of people they are. Can't understand it either. Ma'am? I said I couldn't understand it. His brother's so nice, a real gentleman. Seems hard to believe that they'd even be related, let alone be brothers. Nothing but trouble since he and his wife moved in. You mean it's not their house? Oh, of course not. Don't think either one of them could afford the rent on a one-room apartment, let alone a house. Would you know if they have a car? No, no, not them. Like I said, I don't think he's ever worked. Just lives off his brother. His brother has a car. It's real nice. What kind of a car is it, ma'am? Do you know? Yes, it's a Ford. Do you know what model? Model? Yes, ma'am. Is it a coupe or a sedan? Oh, or... sedan. Real nice. Sort of a dark green. Only I guess it really isn't dark. Then it isn't light, really. Just green. Pretty, though. Yes, ma'am. Do you know if Mr. Field is in right now? Yes, I think so. I saw him out in the backyard a couple of hours ago, him and his wife. She was prancing around in one of them skimpy little sunsuits. Terrible. No decency at all. I tell you, officer, neither one of them's any good. Do you know what Mr. Field does for a living? Oh, you mean does he work? Yes, ma'am. Oh, no. At least I've never seen any indication that he does. All he does is just sit around the yard and throw rocks at my cat. It's terrible. That's what I was going to call you about. Isn't there a law or something about throwing things at poor, dumb animals? Yes, ma'am. Of course, cats aren't really dumb. Lots of times I think they're a lot smarter than some people I know. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could describe Ivan Field for us, ma'am. Oh, sure. He's kind of a little man, not very big. About how tall, ma'am? Oh, maybe five feet seven. How about his coloring? You mean his hair? Yes, ma'am. Dark, very dark. It lets us out. It looks that way. Well, thank you very much, ma'am. Sorry to cause you all this trouble. Oh, no trouble at all. Are you going to arrest him now? No, ma'am. Well, why not? What about the rocks and my cat? Well, I think the SPCA are the people you want to talk to on that. Well, all right. But I tell you right now, Mr. Field isn't going to like it. He likes my cat. He isn't going to like the idea at all when he hears about it. Just wait until he gets home. I'll tell him about his brother has been acting. Well, just a minute, ma'am. Yes? You mean that the man living next door isn't Ivan Field? No. I didn't say it was. It's his brother, Harry. Brother? What's the matter with you, young man? Don't you hear well? Everything I say, you ask me to repeat. Well, I don't mean to, ma'am. It's just that I want to be sure of what you say. What's going on here? First you ask me a lot of questions about Mr. Field, and then I tell you that he isn't home. He and his wife went back east for the holidays. They haven't come back yet. While he was gone, he said that his brother could use the house. I thought at first it would be nice. Then I found out. Harry is nothing like his brother, nothing at all. Well, I wonder if you could describe him for us. My, you want to know about everybody, don't you? Well, we just like a description of Harry Field, ma'am, that's all. Well, he's taller than Ivan. Harry must be close to six feet. Doesn't look anything like Ivan in any other way. Ivan's dark and Harry's light. His hair almost doesn't have any color. He's real blonde. How long ago did they move in? Well, now, let me see. Elizabeth, that's my Persian cat. Mm -hmm. Well, Elizabeth had her last litter in December. December the 12th. Harry and his wife moved in the next morning. I remember that because I was up most of the night with Elizabeth. She didn't need me. Awfully independent. But it was the morning that they moved in. Oh, I remember it well. Elizabeth had six little kittens. It was December the 13th when Harry moved in. And they've been using Ivan Field's car? Oh, my, yes. Hardly a day goes by, but what, they don't drive it somewhere. I wonder if we could use your phone, ma'am. Oh, sure. It's on the table there in the hall. Thanks. I'll check the name through our night. Okay. 
Would you happen to know if this hairy field has any marks or scars on him? Well, now, let me see. I think so. Seems to me that I saw him and his wife out in the backyard one day. He was wearing swimming trunks, and she was in one of those sun suits I told you about. It's graceful. Yes, ma'am. Well, it seems to me that he had a scar on his leg. Uh, yes, uh, just above the knee. I think it was the right leg. No, what I meant, ma'am, was does he have any marks on his face, on his forehead, or on his chin? No, no, no marks. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. The other day I noticed he had a cut over his right eyebrow. It looked like he'd been in a fight. Probably a drunken brawl. Joe? Yeah, anything? Talk to Cunningham. He checked the name. Looks like it might be the same one. What's that? They paroled a Harry Q. Field from San Quentin. Description checks out. When they parole him? December 10th last year, did a term for robbery. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield was first to name its ingredients, ingredients that give you the best possible smoke. Now, Chesterfield is first to give you scientific facts in support of smoking. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfields. First such report published about any cigarette. A responsible consulting organization reports a study by a competent medical specialist and staff on the effects of smoking Chesterfield. For six months, a group of men and women smoked only Chesterfield, 10 to 40 a day, their normal amount. 45% of the group have smoked Chesterfields from 1 to 30 years, for an average of 10 years each. At the beginning and end of the six months, each smoker was given a thorough examination, including x-rays and covering the sinuses, nose, ears, and throat. After these examinations, the medical specialist stated, It is my opinion that the ears, nose, throat, and accessory organs of all participating subjects examined by me were not adversely affected in the six months period by smoking the cigarettes provided. Remember this report, and buy Chesterfields either way you like them, regular or king size. Premium quality Chesterfields, and much milder. <laughs> January 28th, 4.30 p.m. We called the office and told them of the latest developments. Tom Ashford called the local FBI office and arrangements were made to take Harry Field and his wife into custody. A further check on him was made through R&I and we found that his record listed four arrests for armed robbery with only one conviction. He spent four and a half years in San Quentin before he'd gotten his parole. The name of his brother was also checked. He had no previous record. The car in Field's driveway matched the one used by the bandits. 5.12 p.m. The men from robbery arrived and the plan for taking field was formulated. The working detective knows that to successfully apprehend an armed and dangerous suspect, he must act quickly and employ the one big advantage on his side, the element of surprise. By moving rapidly before the suspect becomes aware of any attempt to apprehend him, the officer in many cases can not only avoid bloodshed, but can often have a better chance of preserving any and all physical evidence necessary to prosecute the suspect. 5.36 p.m. We were ready to move in. All set, Joe. The men are on back. Good. No indication he knows what's up. The lights are still on. Let's hope it stays that way. Officer? Mr. Friday? The Jenkins woman. Yeah. Officer! Ma'am, would you mind keeping your voice down? We don't want Field to know we're here. Well, I'm not talking loud, but there's something I want you to know. Well, it'd be better if you went back into your house, ma'am. Just stay there till this is over, oh, will you? That's sort of what I want to tell you about. Ma'am? Well, I got to thinking, and I figured maybe Harry wasn't too bad a sort after all. We don't want to be rude here, but I think it'd be better if you go back in your house. All this talking's liable to let him know that we're here. But that's just it. I don't want anybody hurt, so I called him. What? I called him. Told him he didn't have a chance to give himself up. <laughs> Unknowingly, Mrs. Jenkins had made it impossible to take the suspect without violence. By warning him, she had put him on the alert. We had no alternative now but to apprehend him as best we could. 5.40 p.m. Caleb and Crowley are covering the back. Other fellows are covering the side windows. All right. Let's go. What do you want? Open up. Come on, Field. We want to talk to you. Yeah, I'll be there in a minute. Take it easy. Open up, Field. Police officers. All right, I'll be there in a minute. Let's go. He's stalling. All right. Block. Come on, let's hit it. All right. All right, stand hey, still. Let's go. Fireplace, Joe. I'll get it. 
guys, I'm for all you cops won't leave me alone. I'm straight. Bag's full of money, Joe. Partially burned. My money, I could do what I want with it. You bet you can. Hands behind you. Come on. I'll shake him down. All right. He's clean, Joe. Uh, you got him, huh? Yeah, we got part of the loot, too. He's trying to burn it. Charlie and I'll shake the rest of the house. Right, Mac. All right, how about it, Field? We got the money, people who can identify you. Car parked in the driveway, it fits the description. You've been through this before. You got out of queue on December 10th. You pulled this job on January 21st. Is that right? Okay. Like I said, I fell once. I did my time. Joe? Yeah, Mac? Found his wife hiding in the back bedroom. Found a sawed-off shotgun. All right, let's get him out of here. Say, Frank? Yeah? Message came in for you before I left the office. Forgot about it. Say who it was from? No, I didn't leave a name. Here's a number. Why don't you phone right away? I'll call it now. We can take Field in. Good, Mac. Thanks. We'll be right behind you. We're going to talk to his wife anyway. Okay, Field. Let's go. All right. Come on, Frank. Come on. Hollywood 24709. I don't know anybody with that number. Well, the simple way to find out is to call him, isn't it? It's kind of late. Well, go ahead and call him anyway. Yeah. Here's the phone. I'll check with you later, Joe. Frank. Right, Tom. We'll check. Bye, Tom. Oh, come on. Let's go. I want to use the phone. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. You got a dime? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll leave it for the call. Huh, wonder who it is. Hello. What place is this? Oh. Well, this is Frank Smith. Were you looking for me? Yeah. Yeah, he does. Oh. Yeah, that, that's the right address. Yeah. I should have known. Well, what's that? Call from the Murphy House Cleaning Company. What were they want? My brother-in-law. Called them in to clean up our house. Yeah, what about it? Now they want to know where to send the bill. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 19th, trial was held in federal court, city of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Before a case goes to trial, the working detective has to get all the evidence. He interviews witnesses, takes statements, checks and rechecks. He tries to get all the facts. As a smoker, you too should be interested in facts. You should know Chesterfield is first to give you scientific data in support of smoking. Nose, throat, and accessory organs not adversely affected by smoking Chesterfield. The first such report ever published about any cigarette. Remember that. And next time, buy Chesterfield. Get them regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield give you the best possible smoke. <laughs> Harry Q. Field was tried and convicted of violation of the federal bank robbery statute. He received a sentence of 20 years in a federal penitentiary, McNeil Island, Washington. The investigation showed his wife, Dora Field, was not implicated in any way in the robbery. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Whit Connor, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size, Chesterfield gives you the best possible smoke. Much milder Chesterfield. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. NBC.